thank you for joining me today on the Speak, Inspire, and Love Leadership Podcast. In this series, I talk about the events that transpired in my personal and professional life that led me to believe the power of having a conversation would help me heal from the residual pain of surviving a negative manager. But you heard it before, right? It takes two to tango. So I would also like to explore what role does the receiver actually play in an undesirable leader-subordinate relationship? You know I live for the comments, so let me know what you think. All opinions are welcome. Constantly finding myself validating my importance. I was working 10 times harder convincing my leadership that I was truly the person that everyone else saw me as, right? Everybody else knew that I was doing a good job, but it was harder for me to convince the actual people that mattered, my leadership. I found myself balancing how well I actually did my job. So I didn't appear to be too smart. You know, sometimes you got to dummy down or, you know, minimize is what they say, just to make sure that I was not offending anyone. Because for some reason, you know, you find yourself doing a great job, you're getting all the accolades, but when you become parallel to someone, when you like just right there edging at their heels, that's when, you know, the threat comes in like, oh my goodness, you know, she's getting close. She's on my heels. So they find a way to start chopping you down a little bit. But I did what I had to do to survive, which did not involve a bit of retaliation. I kept my head down and I did my job, right? In some roles, I found myself fighting against jealous coworkers because, you know, I'm the type of person, you know, I come in grinding while everybody else is just grazing. That's the only thing I know how to do is stomp the crap out of every task that I'm given. I don't know any other way to approach a challenge. I just give it all I got and I don't think about anything else except getting that job done. I don't step on people to get to where I want to go. I treat everybody fair, but you know, sometimes people just, (laughs) I don't know. There's a saying that people don't like you just because everybody else love you. That's why I'm here. You know, I want to have these conversations. I want to figure out What is at the root of leadership? How do we fix middle management? And I also found myself experiencing, you know, a lack of gratitude and appreciation from my managers. When I feel appreciated, I give 200% all the time. But when I don't feel appreciated, you'll get 100% from me 100% of the time for eight hours a day, five days a week. Because if I feel or you're giving me an indication you're not appreciating my work and my effort, then why do I push? So constant bad behavior from past bosses just kind of sparked, you know, a call to action just to kind of repair the broken middle management, right? And I do say broken because middle management, they basically hold the organization in their hands. They have the power to make or break the morale of every employee. How do you do that? You might ask. (laughs) Well, think about it. You're an employee. You tell your manager, hey, I got this great idea that I think leadership would like. Let me present the idea to them. They block that communication because of a threat or insecurity or whatever reason. But when they don't take the good ideas from the employees to leadership, you get a lack of morale. And leadership might put out some really good information about a program or a job opening or some type of promotion and leadership, right? The middle manager doesn't take that information down to the junior employee, so they just feel stuck. And the worst thing is when the subordinates have complaints. This is not working right. We're not satisfied with this. If that middle manager don't take those complaints up to leadership, the leadership is going to be like, wow. My organization is amazing. I never hear any complaints. So it's not that the organization is amazing. It's just that middle manager who is blocking that communication. Now, you do have some leaders out there that say, hey, I have an open door policy. Walk in anytime you want. Those are the good ones, right? But is there a retaliation that can go on when you step over your mid-level manager to talk to a higher level leadership? I don't know. A lot of people don't want to take that chance. So they just kind of stay in their little area and hold it all in and just suffer in silence, right? So basically, regardless of my position, I've always shared information with my subordinates. I always gave them everything they needed to do their job because, you know, that's the job of a leader. My job is to make sure that my subordinates, who job I cannot do, right, 
My job is to make sure they have every tool necessary to do their job. I can't go turn screwdrivers or fix the different things that they can, but I can make sure that they have all the tools and everything they need to do their job successfully. And that's what a leader does, open the path. You know, I'm not a micromanager. I don't step in when I'm not needed. I just do what my subordinates need me to do. So I started out as a janitor at a health club, you know, a very, very humble beginning. I remember one of the jobs I had was scrubbing the racquetball marks off the walls in the racquetball court. So I came in twice a week with my little bag of green scrubby pads and I had my simple green and took my shoes off and I went inside that racquetball court and I scrubbed those ball marks off the wall and I did the best job I could possibly do because I felt that I was appreciated. You know, my management, great job, Jeanette. You know, you did a really good job, you know, just accolades everywhere. So I said, okay, this makes me feel good. So I worked harder. And one of the tasks that I had was to scrub the ring off the pool in the hot tub. You know, I never forget where I came from. I always wanted to tell that story to my subordinates to let them know that you think you have it bad. Well, let me tell you my story and, you know, you'll get a better understanding where I came from. And it's good to be vulnerable to your employees, right? You have to let them know that I didn't come out of a china cabinet. I basically started humbly and this is why I'm here today. So I heard someone say the job of a leader is to grow more leaders. In my opinion, I took that to mean leaders delegate responsibility to others. And in my particular role, you know, I have a lot of things on my plate. Sometimes the requirement change before I even get in the door. You work so hard on a project and when you get in the door, it's obsolete. So I had to learn how to find those employees that had a few more extra cycles in their day to take care of some things for me. And I delegated responsibility to others so I can be available for other employees and I can be available to leadership if they needed me to interject in any type of situation. So that showed trust. I didn't hold it all in for myself, you know, and if I'm going to grow more leaders as a leader, two of the most important things you have to do is delegate and trust that the people who you delegate these responsibilities to will follow through on it. Inclusion is another job of a leader. When you're talking about growing other leaders, inclusion is very important. Inclusion means that what you're doing, you're including your employees in a lot of important decisions. Let me give you a little bit of example. One of my employees came to me and said, hey, you know, I really need your help on something. We're doing all these cool things. And, you know, the team on the 10th floor, they're not really including us in a lot of these decisions. You know, we're doing all the work, but they're not including on us in the implementation of some of these cool things that we're doing. So what did I do? I called the meeting because sometimes these things could be a moment of a misunderstanding or just a small miscommunication. So I said, okay, that's what we'll do. We'll just have a meeting and we'll just work everything out. And it worked. We were able to come up with a solution on how the other team would be more involved with different projects and had more buy-in into some of the requirements that were coming down. But what it also created, it created an open line of communication in the form of a weekly meeting or maybe bi-weekly meeting. But now these two teams are going to be communicating on a regular basis. They're going to be communicating, which will allow them to hash out everything and put everything on the table. And it will allow both teams to get that sense that they are being included in all the decision making on these cool things that they're working on. And another thing you have to do as a leader, you have to be vulnerable to your subordinates. You have to let them see that you're human. You know, you were not just taken out of, you know, some gold shelf and hey, here I am. You know, you get tired, you get frustrated, you know, you need a break, you need somebody to vent to. You're human. So being vulnerable is very important in being a great leader. And one of the most important things that I find very, very important is engaging. If one of my subordinates come to me and say, hey, I have a problem, I need to talk about this or that, I put my phone away, I lock my computer screen, I turn my chair, and I give them my full attention to let them know that whatever you are saying to me in this moment, it is very important to me and I am listening to everything. You have my undivided attention and we're going to work this out together. I've done that. You know, employees like, hear the phone ring and they say, you got to answer that? No, they'll call back. Let's work out whatever situation that you need to work out. 
Because one thing that I do know and experienced this in the past, people could be dealing, you know, even before they get to the door, you know, the kids are sick, the car break down. I mean, a number of things could happen before they come through that front door. And it's my job to be understanding and to just listen. One of my favorite quotes is seek understanding before judgment. And also as a leader, you have to be empowering, right? We talked about delegation earlier. And when you delegate, you empower. You say, here, this is yours. You own this. I'm not going to micromanage, but I will be available to help you if you were to get stuck in a particular situation while you are handling this task that I delegated to you. That's empowering. That says, I own this. I am trusted. This is mine. I am a part of this organization. I feel included. This person is being vulnerable and I am here. I am a valuable part of this team. And that also comes down to edification, edifying and uplifting other people, saying something good, a compliment. You know, I'm really big on sending out emails to the whole team, not just people inside of my organization, but everyone. One employee was like, oh, okay, well, please don't do that. I'm kind of shy. I'm like, okay, you did a great job. So I learned everybody does not like that. But my belief is if you do a great job, I want to let the world know because maybe this might open up an opportunity for you to work in another office. And they'll look at, oh, was that employee XYZ who did that great thing? Okay, I think she might fit on our team. You never know what type of opportunities can open, what type of doors can open, or what anything can open based on some of the kind things that people say about you. And one thing that I do understand, even though I am in a position of authority, I do rely on influence to grow leaders because regardless if I am in a temporary position as a leader, because, you know, obviously I'm not going to be here 5, 10, 15 years, I'm going to grow and I'm going to move on to another position. But I still rely on how much influence I have because influence is that one thing that will make people want to work for you without even being asked. That's influence. That is very strong, much stronger than authority. People will never, ever, five, 10 years down the line, they're not going to remember your name, but they will remember how you made them feel. I've been in countless conversations where they said, oh, my manager, who is that? I don't remember her name, but I remember this X, Y, Z thing that she did for me. That is influence and you want to have influence because it'll take you longer, much, much further than authority. So whenever I'm in a situation where I'm not the authoritative figure, I defer to my influence as equity. You have to always remember what you have available to take out will depend on what you put in. If you didn't put anything in, most likely you're not going to get anything out. So I'm a firm believer that if I cannot do the job of my subordinates, I should be willing to be coachable and take on the mindset of a learning leader. One of my pet peeves is when people call me a boss. They're like, hey, boss. Hey, boss. I'm like, uh, Tony Soprano was a boss. <laughs> Don Coleon, you know, they were bosses. I like to refer to myself as the mayor because the mayor is that one important person who runs that small town and who listen to all the concerns of the people and does their best to fill any type of requirements or fill any type of concern or need of the organization. And that's what I try to do, which is fill concerns of the organization. And I am coachable. I like listening and I love answering and asking questions. You know, the job that I'm currently working on right now, the position that I'm currently in right now, I went in learning, 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 just sponging up all the information, everything that I possibly can. And I was respected for that because they see that, okay, hey, she is engaged. You know, this is not her job to know this or learn that, but she's fully engaged and we really appreciate that. So I do have a great relationship with my subordinates and you just can't put a price on anything like having true organic respect from someone you lead. I mean, it's just amazing. So like I mentioned before, managers have the ability to destroy an organization. And there's nothing, you know, more daunting than that one person that come to you with all their concerns, all their bright ideas, and you just squash them like a fly, just smack, smack them down. And uh, that's not what I live for. I live for to help people through their issues and help them get through any situation that they might need my assistance with. So 
the existence of a manager and a leader, like I mentioned before, is to grow more leaders. And you have to do that. Uh, Boy, we've talked about a lot today. I basically wanted to give you a great idea. Basically, when you get to work, if you're a leader or if you're subordinate, be engaging the things that we talked about before. Great idea to go in being vulnerable, empowering, edifying, trusting, and delegating. Those are the things that will help you grow as a leader. And when you get to that position of leadership, you'll have all those things in your toolkit. So you may immediately, I'm telling you, almost instantaneously gain trust. So that's all we're going to discuss today. But what's coming up on our future shows, we're going to have guests that's going to talk about real scenarios that took place on their job. We're going to hear from managers and employees. Our job and our purpose is to learn from both sides of the spectrum, from the managerial side and from the employee side. We're going to give tips on how to get out of the emotional quicksand. You get into a situation at work, it might be a conflict with your manager or a conflict with an employee, but you get stuck into this emotional quicksand. We're going to tell you how to get out of that. We're also going to help you get out of being at the bottom of the barrel. You're that brand new employee. You have no equity. You have no buy-in. No one knows you, but you have all these great ideas that you want to put out, but nobody's listening to you because they're like, who are you? We're going to give you tips on how to get out of that scenario where you're always finding yourself disregarded because you're so new. And what happens when subordinates turn on you? How do you recover from that? How do you run an organization when nobody wants to listen to you? Trust me, I've been in these situations where you have that one ringleader, have the influence of all these employees, everyone you need to do your job successful is more loyal to someone else other than yourself. We're going to give you tips on how to be a great employee and how to be a great manager. So until next time, keep leading and keep learning. Keep learning.